So what I want to do this week is connect actually to what we did a week ago, one and a half weeks ago, when we talked about coordinate transformations. So we started with coordinate transformations. Basically, the main ideas were like there's a coordinate system. XYZ, XYZ. There's another body out in space which has its own local coordinate system. X prime, Z prime, Y prime. And we were interested how to transform back and forth between these coordinate systems. So there was a vector O prime basically shows us the offset, and then there's a rotation of this coordinate system relative to the world coordinate system. And so the main things we had, we had rotation matrices, R, which just can do rotations. We talked about elementary rotation matrices, basically how to rotate about every axis individually, since it's easier to think in this terms. We compose complicated rotations out of many elementary rotations. We basically, in the end, ended up with something which were a homogeneous transformation. We have a rotation matrix up there, then we have a 0, 0, 0, 1 vector at the lowest row, and we have the offset vector in the top part of the last column of the matrix. And that basically combines nicely a translation and a rotation between two coordinate systems. So the idea was that if you multiply A with a vector, oops, you multiply this with a vector in local coordinates, which would be, for instance, Px prime, Py prime, Pz prime, and you have to add a one since it's a homogeneous transformation matrix vector, or whatever you want to call this kind of thing. Um, that would basically transform this into the equivalent vector in the global coordinate system, which would look like this. So essentially, if I wanted to draw this here, I create a little vector here. Here is P prime. That's basically how this looks like in local coordinates. And obviously, this here would be P, the vector in global coordinates. Okay, so this is kind of the main important thing. The, the, the story was mostly about trying to get a little bit of feel for what rotation matrices are, how to transform from one coordinate system to another coordinate system, different interpretations. You can also, coordinate transformations can also be interpreted that you literally move something from one coordinate system to another coordinate system or rotate it. So many ways how to think about it. And basically how to manipulate that, also telling you about the complications that if you have fixed angles or Euler angles, you have different ways, different recipes how you do rotations about individual axes. And rotations are a pain. That was one of the small messages of the day. But the moment you have the rotation matrix, you're fine. You're, you're there. You don't have so much trouble anymore. Just trading it sometimes is a problem. Good. So that was the basics. And the basics was needed for the simple reason that we now have to talk more about how we model robots in terms of their kinematic structures. And that's what we're going to do today. And this topic is near, usually called direct kinematics. It has an equivalent chapter in the textbook. Um, it used to be 2.7 or 2.8 or whatever. The textbook versions change a little bit, but the chapter headers don't change. So you have time to worry about this. And it's really now getting towards the topic of transformations from joint space to ineffective space. We want to start expressing what's happening at the, my fingertip in terms of the joint angles we have. And that's really what we have to get to, since our motors are usually at the joint angles. But the world we manipulate is out there somewhere in a 3D Cartesian world at the fingertip, for instance, or on the foot tip or the nose tip, if you want to. Who cares? And we need to go back and forth, since the target is expressed in a different world than what we control. So we need to learn at some point how to express our goals, which are in an abstract Cartesian world, in terms of our joint angles. So that's what we try to get to. 
um, there's a bigger component how people like to express kinematics. We just call it the Janowitz Hartenberg Convention. And I will go through that and explain it to you. It's not that I'm so deeply fond of it, but it's something which you will see in many robotics papers. And you will see how it's created. It's also a nice exercise which basically makes use of all this knowledge which we already have here. Then we look through some examples of robots. The book is full of nice examples. And we talk a little bit about joint space versus end effector space considerations. This is a topic which you'll see more frequently. Now, the beauty again is that this topic is very nicely covered in the book. So what I'm going to do is I jump back to the book chapter and go through this and hopefully make clear what's written there. That's the dream. Okie dokie. All right. Now I want it to be in this mode so that it's bigger. Okay, good. So that's where we're going to start, and that's where we go through the pages there. I'll see what comes out of that. First of all, so direct kinematics. is in the end a topic where we want to say a point x is a function of my joint angle q. Okay, this is essentially all what we are after. How do I express that? If I have currently the joint angles of my seven degree of frame arm in particular configuration, where is my fingertip? Simple question, but an important question. If you don't know where your fingertip is, can't get the coffee cup. So, and we have to go through a couple of things. First thing is, there's two kinds of robots, and the one is called an open chain robot, and then there's closed chain robots. So we will happily avoid closed chains, but we'll just mention it to you. It's a little bit more annoying. So an open chain robot is something like this. So, you can just draw it. Here's the first link, there's the second link, next link, this link, this link, this, actually I can branch, I can go, go have different links in this direction. Strange robot? Well, it's a hand, think about it. How do you model a hand? You look at the palm, in the palm you go and branch towards the fingers. So it's not so strange after all. But this is called an open chain because the, 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 the chain never closes back onto itself. And the alternative is that at some point you close the chain like this. What happens when you close the chain, you actually lose a degree of freedom. So somehow you cannot say that this is a, is a motor, and this 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 is a motor, and you can move them independently. They're not. They're coupled now. And that creates some additional problems. Now, I'm not going to go into closed chains. But there is essentially, you can treat closed chains very frequently simply as an open chain system where you create additional constraints that two points need to stay together and you can treat it algebraically quite nicely. So it's actually not so complicated. The topic is just a little bit more than what we do. So where are closed chain robots? Any ideas? Well, all of you are occasionally maybe about 40% a day, a closed chain robot. That is when you stand with both of your feet on the ground and your feet are not slipping, then actually this here, my, my, my legs form a closed chain. So the ground can actually couple my two legs together. That is also a closed chain. So most of the time we avoid modeling that reality again and, and basically say we assume the, the, the robot is floating in the air and we just have uh, forces from the ground which keep things in a particular position and we formulate this constraint. So there's a little bit of linear algebra. Maybe we get to this at some point in operational space control, but right now I don't want to go too much into that. The other component, open chain is nice since everything is, is essentially from starting from here, having joint angles, everything, you go from one coordinate to the next coordinate to the next coordinate to the next coordinate, depending where you want to go, it's just multiplication of homogeneous transformation matrices. So we'll focus on that a little bit. Okay. Let's see. Where do we have to go? Fine. 
So nice graphics in the book. Um, so this is a typical sketch of a robot where you have a base coordinate system. So the, 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 when you define what's a base coordinate system, okay, usually you, well, it depends. Most of the time you would prefer something which is fixed in the world. So for instance, here, that's my base coordinate system. That would be cool. Um, you can also have a base coordinate system which is moving around. So it could be, for instance, attached to my pelvis if I'm a humanoid robot, and that might be more suitable. But in the end, you define it. Let's assume for the moment it's a fixed base system. Fixed base systems mean the base is somewhere bolted towards the world, which is much easier to analyze than what is called floating base system. This is what the humans are. They are essentially, we are never bolted to the ground. It creates a little bit of extra mass. Okay, so base coordinate system. And then what is really mostly interesting for us is the end effector coordinate system. So that's what we use to manipulate the world. It's not entirely true. We actually frequently, if you are a robot out in the normal world, you may actually care when you bump with your elbow into things and withdraw your elbow. So actually, we might be interested in intermediate coordinate systems as well. But practically, you can just choose whatever point you want on the robot and call it your end effector coordinate system or your coordinate system of interest and work with that. So it's just basically how long you do run linear algebra to get to this point and, and compute where this point is in x, y, z space. Now, the book has this interesting little um, convention, just going through that for a second, about the end effector coordinate system. That is a little silly, but it's worthwhile mentioning because the book does it. So let's look at that silly end effector here. So the end effector they have here is what is called a standard jar gripper. So come on like this. The idea is like you have basically a gripper which you can open and you can really move it together and grasp something. So it's one of the most trivial grippers you can have. It's essentially just one degree of freedom which moves these two pieces together and squishes something together. And it's been one of the typical manipulators or end effectors which is used in industry a lot for simple pick and place graphs. Um, based on that, basically, there is some definitions which the book uses, which I don't find particularly useful, but what the heck. So he basically says, when you move your gripper towards an object, you call this direction here the direction of approach, and it's, I think, called A. Then you have another uh, coordinate system, or another axis in the coordinate system, sorry, which is basically the direction of the sliding of those uh, gripper components, and that is called S. And then we have to uh, make it a right-handed coordinate system, A, S, um, okay sticking to the back is the normal on this entire story, which is called in. Um, reality is, this is completely bogus. You know, you don't need conventions like that. It's totally up to you. The moment you work with a multi-fingered hand, it almost goes to hell anyway. It's not so interesting anymore. But the book uses that throughout, so you just might want to know how it was created, and it's just created out of intuition. Let's make up a convention. We're moving towards something that is called the A-axis, the sliding of the grippers is S, and then, well, something is left, which is the normal on the two of them. All right, and if you go with this convention, then you can obviously, well, let me see if I get everything still in here nicely, yes. So we can create a homogeneous transformation matrix, which basically expresses each of those uh, components in S and A as the rotation matrix. So basically, these are, remember rotation matrix, the vector of a rotation matrix, the, sorry, the columns of a rotation matrix are the unit coordinate vectors expressed in global world coordinates. So this is essentially what he writes here. He has a little superscript B, which means things are expressed in the B coordinate system, which is his base coordinate system, the world coordinate system. And he has N, S, A, so that makes the rotation matrix P is the translation vector between the base coordinate system and the end effector, and that's where you are. 
So fine, we can express our end effect of position as a homogeneous transformation matrix. Well, that's not particularly deep and surprising. The interesting question is how do you get to express all these vectors n, s, and a, and you know, also p in terms of the joint angles q. So that is the more annoying part of life. And we'll see how we do that. Okay, so let's try to make a little example. And I'm just gonna borrow this one picture from the book and try my best to make it something. So I wanna go to this picture and see, can I make this bigger? In a free world, I would be able to do this. Yeah, let's just go. So fine, we'll just do this example, but it, I do it my way, okay? So it's now a very simple planar rule. We have an x-axis, a y-axis, and now it has basically a joint here, it has a joint here, there, and that here is the end effect up here. Okay, so this is typically what you could think of here as an elbow joint, this would be this joint, here's my, no, sorry, shoulder joint, is this joint, elbow joint, is this joint, and my hand is stiff, there's no additional resistance. So very simple, what is called a planar 2D robot. Um, now we need to basically define joint coordinates. And essentially all we care about, and you will see this in the book occasionally, that we want to describe things usually in terms of minimal number of coordinates, coordinates, not some arbitrary number of coordinates. So how many things do I need to describe a two degree of freedom system is usually two. And I can now just basically go and say, okay, let's take this here as the angle of theta one, which he uses as well. Now I could do something else. I need now also to express. So this tells me how my upper arm is moving relative to the world coordinate field. Now I have to express my elbow. I have multiple choices what I can do. I could just go and say, hey, let's just continue this line down here and call this here theta 2. It's not what he did. But it's totally valid to do it this way. It's this new definition, free country do whatever you want, it just has to be correct. And then stick to the definition. Now this is kind of a little bit of a weird thing if you think about it. Since in a normal robot, we have basically for every degree of freedom, we have a position encoder. And the position encoder tells you basically about this angle theta one. Now theta one is pretty easy because <coughs> that's going to be moving relative to the base. Now theta two basically measures the upper arm relative to the world coordinate system. Now how would I directly measure that? I think it's not a, not a just like the column. Yes, but I do it this way. That's the cool thing. Just for fun. And then I go back to that. I don't want to be too early. Um, so that is possible to basically, like for instance, maybe you have an external camera which observes two points here and then can actually estimate this angle directly. And then this, this kind of coordinate system might be very suitable. However, if you don't measure it this way, but rather have another encoder here at this, at this point, then that would be kind of a stupid definition since it's kind of indirect. You would rather try to take coordinate systems where you have a direct measurement where this coordinate system is. So now I'm fixing that, as you suggested, and go to the same convention as used in the book. That is terrible. I'm supposed to be continuing this line. So we're measuring theta two relative to the theta one angle. Okay, so now it's a relative measurement. What I had before was an absolute measurement. Again, when you start with a robot, so you get the now a robot, and I don't give you anything, and you just take it apart, figure out how things are moving, then you basically define all these joint angles the way you want. You basically have to agree on a couple of things. You also have to agree on what is positive. So let's make this be a positive. It would be this direction if it's a, it's a positive rotation. Because the z-axis is sticking out, it is a positive rotation. If you don't like this, you can make it the other way around. Just stick to the convention. So this is all within your freedom. <coughs> Just many people do it in similar ways. Good. 
Now, what else do we have? We have to say this here is L1. Well, he calls it A. Fine, I can call it A2. I'm very creative. Let's call it A1. And this here then has the length A2. Any other thing he wants to complain about? No. Good. So fine, let's try to express this point here in as a function of the joint angle. The position of this point here is our ineffective position as a function of the joint angle. So see how well this works. But it's actually very hard, so we just do cosines and sines. So fine. In order to get, get this here the x component, well, I basically do two things. I take this is easy, this part. This is just the a1 times cosine theta one. Now this here is a2 times cosine of theta 2 no. plus theta 1. Okay, both of them have to be added to get this. All right? So fine. Same in this direction as this becomes the sine. Good. So that means we, if we want to create our big homogeneous transformation matrix, um, we now already know the offset vector. So that's cool. So it is bop, 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 in x direction. In x direction. It is a1 cosine of theta1. I do that abbreviated notation, which the book does, so I don't have to write the name down. Plus a2 of cosine of theta 1 plus theta 2, okay? And in the y direction, I would get a1 sine 1 plus a2 sine of angle 1, angle 2. And then in z direction, I have 0, and since it's a homogeneous transformation matrix, I fill in all the other guys. Good. Now, Rotation, we see a little now a little trend of rotation matrix. So how does this look? Does this that look like? Okay, let's define a coordinate system and I do it again my way. So I call this direction here X and this direction Y. Why do I do that? So I like actually things which are simple. When the arm when the angles are zero and zero, so the arm is stretched here. And my ineffective coordinate system coincides with my world coordinate system. And I believe that makes it easier for me to think. It's totally subjective. Okay? That's just who I am and what I like to do. But if that is the case, now we can basically start expressing um, this rotation relative to this coordinate system. Now, it's not particularly hard, okay? So how much have you been rotating this coordinate system relative to the world? Uh, we first rotate it by theta 1 and then additionally by theta 2, so it's theta 1 plus theta 2. And what kind of a rotation have we been doing? Well, we've been exclusively rotating about the y-axis sticking out. Then we recall elementary rotations around the z-axis look like what? They have something, they have, they rotate about, my, my space out. So they rotate about the z axis. So I get a 1 here. I will have 0, 0 there, 0, 0 there. And then there comes something with cosines and sines. So I believe it was cosine of angle 1 plus 2, then minus sine of angle 1 plus 2, then sine of angle 1 plus 2, cosine of angle 1. And in general, I make more frequently mistakes in the signs. But I hope this is correct. Is it wrong? Uh, no, uh, what does this matrix represent? Hmm? What does this matrix represent? This year? Uh, the whole matrix. <laughs> this is called a homogeneous transformation matrix. And uh, what does it come from? Okay. What is it? Good idea would be to either come to the lectures or pay attention to the lectures or read the chapters in the books. So a homogeneous transformation matrix is a rotation and a translation from one coordinate system to the other. A 
in chapter 2.7, just before, explains that in the previous lecture, which is lovely and recorded, if you remember correctly, explains that as well. Translation vector, rotation, basically combine a complete translation, which is a rotation <coughs> times a vector in local coordinates plus an offset a vector in local this stuff you need. So check it out. I promise you, I will test you like hell with this stuff. I was still promising. Okay, so we finished our homogeneous transformation matrix, which basically tells us how to relate this point here into global coordinates using the angle theta one and theta two. And now we can compare it to the book and see how brilliant it is or not. <coughs> Never know. And ah, the guy is full of just disgusting. Everything is different. That's so annoying. Well, it may be not everything. Let's check. Okay, A1 <coughs> times C1. Let's take the offset vector. I think we agree on this one. A1 times sine, this and that. We agree on this. We have a zero there and a one. We have zeros. I like when we agree on zeros. And then the rotation matrix is totally messed up. Because he used that stupid coordinate system. <laughs> exactly. You should be killed for this nonsense. You use the local coordinate system, which is different, so you get a different result. Not very surprising, but that's what he did. It's actually, see, mine is much nicer. If I make it. <laughs> <laughs> because, see, look at my beautiful rotation matrix, which is here, which rotates about D, it's completely intuitive. Now look at this messy thing. It basically has the one suddenly down here, it has the, the sines and cosines completely scrambled all over the place. So that's why I don't like this, huh? this, this notation. We could derive this as well, it's basically a different coordinate system where you have to scramble things a little bit and get to the same result. But here you go. That's the misery of definitions. So results look entirely different just because I made a different definition of my effect, the coordinate system. Despite everything is in the end expressed the same way. So this is something which is annoying in robotics. So you have two people modeling the same robot, they do different conventions and you cannot compare the results, you cannot do anything, you cannot share any code. So, good. Given this misery, people try to come up with some more general way of doing, I don't know, first, yeah, to, of describing robots, and it's the Danavid Heikenberg convention. We'll get to this in a second, but let me just now quickly follow the book, and he just wants to basically tell you that for an open chain system, you can think of your entire transformation, which we just created, as a concatenation of local transformation from one coordinate system to the other. So for instance, I can create, I should do this in a different color maybe, except that it's not visible in the video at all. But I, does this thing work at all? So I could create an intermediate local coordinate system here as well, and make this X, and this here Y. Okay? And I could basically figure out the homogeneous transformation matrix to get to this coordinate system, which is just a simpler version of this, where we just get rid of the addition of some <coughs> cosines and sine, uh, theta and theta two. And then I go to the next step. So in the end, basically, you can write the entire transformation as, well, if we use the same notation as he uses, I'm not totally off the road all the time. Actually, he, he nicely shows it here. So we basically, we are in the nth coordinate system, which is our end effector coordinate system. So you have a transformation matrix which takes you to the n minus one's coordinate system, all based on the joint angles at this local coordinate system. That's nice. In order to go now, if I, if I have this model the right way, I basically just go from here to there by just needing theta one. I go from here to there by just needing theta two. So I don't just depend on all joint angles with every transformation, just only on one. And then I chain it backward until I'm in the uh, base coordinate system. So now things become a little bit more methodology. We can start chaining our little pieces of knowledge together and see how you can actually get more complicated computations through simple local com computations. 
And that you will see is going to haunt us for the next two, three weeks since that gets to the point of that we can create recursive algorithms. We just basically express something from one coordinate system to the other coordinate system locally, chain them together and get the global result. If you do it right, it's just a recursion how you move up and down the kinematic chain of a robot. That makes an open chain robot particularly nice. Are you happy with this? If you're not happy, speak up or be silent forever. Okay. You're married now to that material. Cool. So, now let me see what comes next. So we have this. We, mm, is there anything interesting which I want? No, this is just more stuff. Okay, let's go to the dinner with Hartenberg Convention. So this is now trying to put everything into a nicer formalism. And you will see why this is kind of useful. And my goal now is to explain that picture. So that will take me about 10 minutes or so. <clears throat> yes, uh, so for the, um, uh, like the, the product of the matrices is so much easier. Um, Say it again, which matrices? Um, the A yeah. and homogeneous transformation yeah, matrix. Transformation. So um, does it depend on the number of join angles, like total number of join? So it starts from zero to for every degree of freedom, for every joint angle you have, you need a transform. So how do we write the previous uh, matrix as a matrix by like multiplication of different matrices? Because there's n. So n the matrix which I just had yeah. here. Well, essentially, well, okay, it's too bad. <coughs> um, I erased it already. But we had one transformation which basically takes us from here to there. Okay. <coughs> so there was kind of from the base coordinate system to the um, elbow coordinate system. Uh, if I just quickly recreate this, it would look like this. You have my local coordinate system x, y. Here's my global coordinate system. Let's call this here 1, x0, y0. Now, and this here was a1. So the transformation between these two guys would be a homogeneous transformation matrix, which we call a1 to 0 <laughs> equals a rotation about the z-axis with theta 1. So that becomes here. So you get the whole thing. I just get <coughs> C, um, C1 minus S1, 0, S1, C1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Then it becomes 0, 0, 1 by convention. Offset is a1 in x direction, so that is going to be. I have to express that here. That's a1 cosine one, a1 sine one, zero. Okay, one. That is the here. And now I do the next one. It's the same. This is relative. If I just basically go into this one coordinate system, the next joint looks exactly the same way. So now you have x2 and y2 up here, and here I have theta2, which is from this point of view, it's exactly the same as what I have here. Okay, same thing. Okay, the Denham with Hartenberg Convention. So, what's the goal? The goal is to try to come up with a recipe how to minimize the arbitrariness how people <coughs> define coordinate systems and chaining through a robot. And you will see it is okay. Practically, you don't have to do that if you're happy with something else. But it's a, it's a reason, reasonable recipe. And the nice thing is basically, in the end, it creates a standard transformation between every coordinate system to the next one. It's always the same kind of a matrix, but you will see in a second. So I will try to recreate that plot, since then I can focus on the things which I care about in a nicer way, which now challenges my drawing skills. Fine, let's start. Here's one circle, and set the other one, and then there's a little one inside. Go down here. Not gonna be pretty. Go up there. 
Don't laugh, okay? It makes me insecure. <laughs> Okay. Right. Let's get some first order approximation. It's not too terrible. Okay, good. So this is one degree of freedom. So one little bone made from metal or plastic. 3D printing these days becomes popular. And now we take the next one. There, here, oops, ah, not that one. Then I get some other thing here. Get this, move down there, and move down there. And yeah, not, not too terrible. Good. So fine, we have two links attached to each other. Quick remark. Um, we have now axes of which we can, uh, along which we can move. So here's one. And this is now in the book denoted as i plus 1. You know, you could call it i, you could call it i plus 1. It's totally up to you. The next axis is here, this joint. So this is kind of the only joint which we have drawn completely where two links overlap. This is called i. And then the last one back here is called I minus one. So let's just look at this one joint for one second of time. Now, the first thing when you see that thing, oh, the two things are going to turn with respect to each other. But they don't have to. They could also slide in and out away from each other. So when something slides away on a, on a linear path, this is called a prismatic joint. Or some people call it translational joint. Also fine. Many words for the same thing. If it rotates, it's called a revolute joint. Okay? These are the two kinds of things which we can realize technically relatively easily. Things which is like a piston goes that the, the tra does translations, things like a normal electromotor just rotations. Just keep this in mind. The good thing is, both of these two kinds are going to be captured in what we're going to do as we will see in a second. Just also for information, so in your little homogeneous transformation matrix, if you have a prismatic joint, then your offset vector suddenly has this theta parameter, since that's basically the length of your offset is going to be modeled by your degree of freedom theta. If you have something which rotates, then the theta is a rotation matrix. Make sense? <coughs> this. Okay, now let me see whether I can recreate the recipe of creating these different coordinate systems and what they mean. The idea is basically to get a recipe how to go from one to get an homogeneous transformation matrix from one joint to the next joint and to the next joint. And the idea is to actually split it in every translation from one joint to the other. We split it into two parts as we will see in a second. So, fine, what do we have to do? We start here at the i plus 1 joint and define a coordinate system. O. O i. Actually, interesting. So, I, did, I never liked this notation, which is the i's and the i plus 1's really confuse the hell out of me. Fine. Um, so, he basically starts, and he basically says, okay, the z axis, <coughs> and that's what we do by convention. The z-axis is always going to be along the line of the axis of rotation of the axis of translation, but that's the axis of which it's basically the, 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 the degree of freedom is moving. Okay, so he calls this now zi. It's not too bad. Now the next component what he chooses is actually xi. And xi now has a, has a recipe. It basically, it's meant to be such that it is normal uh, along a line which is normal on this axis and on this axis, on the i plus 1's joint axis and the i joint axis. A little annoying. So this here, this little um, rectangle means orthogonal. So let me try to do this 
the same nice DIC data. So basically, you know, I just make it up since I have no idea what's orthogonal in my 2D plot anyway. <coughs> so this here is now xi. And this here is meant to be orthogonal to this. And it's meant to be orthogonal to this axis. Okay, so this is just a recipe. You know, someone made it up. Last but least, we have x and z. Well, then y follows automatically. Just right hand rule, stick your finger in the x direction. No, this one doesn't go to z. This one goes to z. That means uh, my y is now going to stick into the back somehow. Fine. In his world, you know, what this world looks like, it's sticking to the back like this. Okay, this is y i. So we got a complete definition of the coordinate system. Small remark. It can frequently happen that this axis, i plus 1, and i are parallel. And then you just choose it as you wish, where you put the origin of this coordinate system. If they are oblique to each other, then the, the normal is well defined. If the, the normal is not well defined, just pick whatever you like. Make it as simple as possible. Cool. Now, what else do we need? We have this, this, this. And now we basically have to look at this coordinate system here. So, same recipe. We have the local z axis, which is now called z i prime. So that's an intermediate coordinate system which we're using, which goes along the axis i. Good. Now, xi prime oops, goes the same direction as xi. So the two of them coincide. And then necessarily yi follows in whatever way it is. So yi prime, same, same game. Let me see how he drew it. So I draw it in a similar way. C, D, D. Just try to make this pretty, as pretty as I can. So this is y i prime. Good. Now we can figure out what does it take to get from this coordinate system to this coordinate system, or the other way, from this coordinate system to this coordinate system. Cool. So we have a offset a1, a i, sorry is essentially the length of that link i. We have this here, yeah, it's actually written here. This here is link i, and this here is link i minus 1, okay? So the length of link i is a y, and we define now the difference between this coordinate system and this coordinate system as the length. Now the length is kind of a arbitrary thing, you could say it's from the way out of the point to this way out of point, where you can say from the axis of rotation to the axis of rotation. And essentially, we usually like to do something which is kind of the most intuitive, ideally something centered here to something centered here. But the general calculator convention gives you some option to basically move it outside of it. Okay? Weird? Yes, definitely. Cool. So that means we have already our translation vector, or our homogeneous transformation, which takes us from the i to the i prime coordinate system. So we can start filling this in. So there is something which is called a transformation from i to i prime. And this, and we know there is a vector ai, which goes in the direction of x. That's actually pretty straightforward. So we have essentially ai, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, and that's good. <coughs> Next question is, what's the rotation between these two guys? Well, rotation, one thing about, nice, uh, about elementary rotation is there's usually one axis which stays constant. And that's x i prime and x i are the same. So we've been rotating about x somehow. Okay? And we have to just figure out how much we have been rotating about x. And we 
you just, we don't know. So these are two coordinate systems. If you assume they are not the same, then you have to somehow rotating about X and we just call this, he calls it A, no, alpha I. And essentially, how would I be able to draw this in a reasonable way? I have no idea. It's like if this is the Z axis here, and I would try to <coughs> draw it like here, then this here would be something like this would be alpha I. You can get the picture. I can't draw it in a particularly pretty way in a 2D plot. Good. So we are rotating about alpha I about the X axis. So X axis rotation, we put a one here, zero, 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 zero. And then we have cosine alpha I minus sine alpha I sine alpha I cosine. And we have our first transformation, how to go from the i to the i prime coordinate system. Because it was so much fun, we do it one more time to complete our entire thing. So this is now basically addressing um, that we, for the next two axes, we have to do the same game. So we have to find the normal again between the two of them. So it's the same recipe. If I go down here a little bit. So there's a coordinate system down here and a normal. So let me start with the normal. So this would be the normal. Then let me, sorry, let me make this a little bit more oblique so that this doesn't look like everything is parallel. Okay, so this is meant to be a normal. This is meant to be a normal. And we have now here the x uh, i minus 1 axis, x i minus 1 axis, which corresponds to the x i minus 1 prime axis, but we don't even go to that. We have a distance here, which is a i minus 1. That's the length of link i minus 1. Uh, then we have here something which goes into the z direction, which is z i minus 1. Then necessarily y has to stick somewhere, so he has it stick in this direction, has to be normal on those two guys. So this here is y i minus 1. Cool. And last but least, we need a few more of information, so we need to know this distance, I don't know, from here to there. I don't know where to put it anymore. I'm not leave a lot of space. It's essentially this distance here is what we're going to call di. It is nicer shown here. Okay, so now we know that the translation between those two coordinate systems is going to be di in the z direction. So fine, let's start next homogeneous transformation. We now go from the I prime to the I minus one, okay? I minus one coordinate. Zero, 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 one. We are translating in the Z direction. So we have zero, zero, DI. <coughs> okay, and then we just have to rotate. Now in this case, the zi and the z, zi prime and zi minus one axis are the same, so it's a rotation about the z axis. Fine, I can already put this information in here: one zero 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 zero, and then somehow these two coordinate systems are twisted with respect to each other. And I think he shows that more nicely. If I find it on a good day, yes. So you basically they are twisted by the angle theta one two of them, like this. If I wanted to, if I would take this x-axis, project it in here, then this here would be theta 1. Okay, you notice when this plot gets fuller and fuller, it becomes harder and harder to read, particularly with my handwriting. But the good thing is that we now this is cosine theta i minus sine theta i sine theta i cosine and we are done. 
So if you multiply these two guys together, you get the complete transformation from I to I minus one. And it has a total of four parameters. Let's see whether really you have alpha I, A I, B I, and theta I. These are called the Denovit Heisenberg parameters, four. Okay? And we can interpret them in different ways. So if we, for instance, have a prismatic joint, then di would actually be our variable parameters. So di here would change as your actuator, your piston goes in and out. Okay? The rest of the stuff would be static. So theta i in this case would be a static variable. You could just describe how these two bones are arranged with respect to each other, but they can't change because they can only slide up and down. They cannot rotate with respect to each other. And if we have a revolute joint, well, then theta i becomes the variable which we care about. That's our degree of freedom. And di is going to be fixed. And that alpha i here and a i, these are just static parameters. Usually links don't change length. That would be weird. And alpha i is just basically how the one end of the link to the other one are kind of twisted. Good. Painful. But there is some advantages to that. So when, after you went through that, and the reality is, whenever you get a new robot and you have to go through these things and make up all your coordinate transformations, you sit there for a few hours. And then you give it to someone else to double check whether you've made some errors. Well, you can also just then model it graphically by creating a stick figure. And if that stick figure looks like what you had in mind, then that's good. Often it doesn't. Okay, so, so we have everything defined. We know everything now here about the specific He basically in the book now writes down the recipe in a narrative. Talk. Um, I'm not going to go through this anymore. Um, if there's any ambiguity, if basically things are parallel, you just pick whatever is the easiest for you. It's also easy to be resolved. <laughs> And what matters is hopefully that these two matrices are correct. Double checking. Um, I to I prime has one, the reserve cosine minus that, and A1 up there. And this one looks pretty correct as well. So these are the two, the, the two transformations which we have to go. And if you multiply them together, you would get something which looks like this. Now what is nice is now, if someone gives you the homogeneous transformation, uh, sorry, the, the Denovit, the Denovit Hartenberg parameters for a particular transformation from one link to the other, you just have to plug it into that matrix and you know the transformation. This, this matrix never changes since we have now a very static framework how to model the transformation from one link to the other. And that's kind of nice. So you now can actually go to the point that you describe a complete robot kinematic system by just creating a table instead of this. Just basically create a table which has here alpha, B, theta, and A. Okay, so these are the four parameters which we deal, and then we have basically for link one, for link two, for link three, for link four, for link five, a particular set, and that defines how you go from link one to two, two to three, two to four, et cetera. So that's kind of what people call then the Hockenberg parameters. They create this table and say, off you go, we know what's going on. And it's close to unique. There are some arbitrariness which you can have, but not too bad. Cool. And they just describe this one more time as a recipe. It's essentially what I've been talking about. I'm not going to talk about how we deal with branching joints, but it's in essence nothing profoundly different. Close chains we don't look at. It's a pain. Yes? So I mean, the transformation you went from um, the, the end link to the first link. I went from I to I prime, I prime to I minus one. But then the table goes from one to five. 
So I, fine. now I'm assuming I have five links. I just made something up as an example. So we would now basically create this in. So let's assume this here is now i plus one is the same as five, and i is four. So I would basically now put in this uh, the parameters which takes it from five to four. So this four parameters, and then I repeat this from four to three, from three to two, etc. So um, what happens? So this one is the starting end for the resolution. What happens in the other one? Ball and jockey joints are beautiful, but they are technically very hard to realize. So they, I know hard, there is people who try to create ball and socket joints with very complex mechatronics. I've never seen them to be used in a standard game. So ball and jockey joints are with your shoulder joints or your arc. It's literally a socket in a ball, and it can basically move in two directions at the same time. So technically, these are very hard to realize. And so most of the time, they're always created by having two sequential actuators, which do that. I'll actually show you some examples in a second which approximate that with some problems that you will see. <coughs> yes, doing this with ball and socket joint, you get a level of pain, which then you need to model it as a transform as, as a rotation matrix, which can capture it all which is more complicated. Now it depends how this thing is modeled. You can model it in the end. Would that be a rotation matrix? Well, all our rotation matrix is a 3D rotation matrix. All our R's rotate in 3D. Yes, exactly. It would basically simultaneously rotate about two things, which becomes essentially like more like a quaternion-like formulation, which is much easier for these kind of things. Yes? Are you considering the high minus I'd be transforming from I to I minus one. Oh, that's I. This is why we use this notation. I, I, I would not use the link the, the, the numbering this way. I would prefer if we had basically call this here I minus one and this here I. But he just did it differently. So that is B What you call I and what you call I minus one in the end is totally up to you. It just has to be consistent. I don't quite like the way he did it, so I just don't, but I don't want to do contrary to the book. Good. Um, but it, it, uh, no, this is just doing the closed loop. I don't want to do it. Kinematic. So fine. Here come now a whole bunch of examples, which are fun to go through, and you see a little bit of different realizations different kinds of typical manipulators which people have been realizing. Super simple is now our two-joint arm becomes a three-joint arm. It's a planar arm. So all the z-axis are sticking out like this. And from the denerberg hartenberg uh, notation, we have three link lengths, A1, A2, A3, A1, A2, A3. Um, Alpha i and v i don't happen. There's no translation between these intermediate coordinate systems here. The v i doesn't happen because they're all on top of each other. Alpha i, there's no twisting of the coordinate systems. And all what you have is the joint angle theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3, and that describes the entire robot. So now it becomes pretty straightforward and nice to look at, which is pleasant. Okay, he basically goes into the effort of writing out all the transformation matrices and the entire transformation then, as it would look like from end effector coordinates to base coordinates. Okay, parallelogram robot, that's a little bit more complicated. Let me. So this is, this is a robot basically which um, you have two motors here, one motor moves this bar left and right, the other motor moves this bar left and right. This creates this kind of complicated coupled <coughs> motion. Actually not, not complicated, but it's a strangely coupled motion, which, yeah, it's rarely used actually. I mean, no, let me go to something which is more intuitive and fun. Um, okay, so here is a simple spherical arm. So what's happening here, we have one degree of freedom which rotates in the vertical plane, then another one which rotates 
in the perpendicular plane to that. So that creates a little bit of a ball at a socket joint idea. And if you basically have two rotations intersect in this point, that means we can rotate in two directions simultaneously, which is nice. Um, cool. Then here is an additional a prismatic joint where this thing can, um, what does this thing do? It goes in and out. And let me double check. No, this rotate, no, D3 goes up and down. So this is a prismatic joint where you can go up and down. Fine. All these robots basically have been realized at some point in industry for pick and place. Like this is a typical robot, which what can it do? It can rotate, turn, and then go up and down. So you have a typical robot which could pick up little electronic parts, put it on a CD, uh, PC board, for instance, and create motherboards for your computer. And these robots, when you, when you see them in industrial realizations, they move at speeds which are incredible. They just do things so fast and extremely accurate. Um, next thing is sort of a spherical arm. We have this right now. It's just what comes out of this in terms of transformation matrices and it complete transformations is always kind of similar. Now what's my anthropomorphic arm? Here we go. So anthropomorphic arm now is rotating here, then rotating there, and <coughs> so basically, if I take, if I could take this picture and just turn it like this, then theta one would be my shoulder joint rotating, and this here would be more like my elbow joint. Is that correct? Kind of. Uh, I can try to do this. Okay, so now I'm like this. Then this here would become my wrist joint, and I could move this on top of that. So it's a three degree of freedom arm again with three rotations. So this is kind of an interesting design, which you will see repeatedly in, in robots. So you have one rotation, so it's like mimicking a wrist joint. You have one rotation in this direction, one in this direction, and then another rotation along the arm. So it's three rotation intersecting in one point, which gives you like almost, we can orient this, this, this robot almost in all directions. Actually, most of the time you can orient it in all directions. But then there are some, some pitfalls which are some things. So let me get rid of my big picture here. So let's, for, for a second, the true ball in a socket joint, if I just make a little picture of that. So here's my ball, and like this. So this ball can obviously easily move left and right. It goes in the, in the plane, out of the plane, and it could actually also twist. So it actually has three degrees of freedom. And this is what this is meant to mimic. Now this works pretty nicely for most of the time, except when you get into certain postures. So let me show you this one posture where things don't work anymore. So if I have the lower degree of freedom like this, that's as it was, going up. Now I have this other one here. So this is still fine. But now I have moved this degree of freedom number two such that my N effector sticks up. Okay, and if I do this, I now suddenly have the N effector sticking up like this. Okay, terrible drawing. Okay, but what you notice now is actually in this particular posture, the number one and the number three degree of freedom are aligned. So they have become redundant. And if you wanted to move the gripper now in this direction, you would figure out you can. And that would be perpendicular to the rotation that this thing kind of can generate. You would just break your arm. Okay, so there's now no way that you can move in a particular, in, in this particular direction because you would first have to turn this motor to be like this and then you can rotate like this. But instantaneously you can. So it, in this, posture, which is called a singular posture in the robot arm, we've lost one degree of freedom because it's a stupid posture. Mm -hmm. And then the analogy between the <coughs> ball and socket joints and this doesn't work anymore. So this is a much nicer design that you can realize that. So it's much nicer. If you want to actuate that while well, doing it with muscles, it's a very nice way to do it. With motors, it's much harder. Okay, Singular postures will bother us 
they exist in most robots somewhere. And they will make the algebra to become a little bit nasty in some of our, our transformation if we have this x to f of q to our kinematic transformation, direct kinematics. If you linearize that at a point, then you get a singular matrix and, and all kinds of nasty things happen. We'll talk more about this. But it's important to notice that our technical realization of many degree of freedom, many degree of freedom robots often create some weaknesses in some parts of the workspace. Now, you can design things nevertheless that they don't matter. Like, maybe this arm never operates up there so the boys manipulate the front of it so it's all fine. It doesn't happen. It's not a part of the workspace which matters. So the humans are cool, but our muscle-based systems involve in jockey jobs going, we don't have these singularities, but most robots do. Okay, actually there's one nice example along those lines. Have you ever seen humanoid robots walking? Like the Honda Asimo, you will actually figure out that many of them, they walk like this. And that's really stupid, energetically. Well, you can try to do this all day long. You will need a few extra, I don't know, French fries to survive. <laughs> um, they do this actually because when they stretch their legs, they do exactly the problem that their thigh and the calf rotation degrees of freedom get aligned. They get singularities in the map, and it's much easier to tell the robot to just be bending its knees and you don't have this algebraic singularity. So there's ways to avoid this, obviously, but it takes some extra effort. Let's see, okay. Now we can make things more and more complicated by chaining things together, like you have here rotation, rotation, translation, and then you have a wrist on top. So that's a little bit now like a six degree of freedom arm mimicking more something which is like a human arm if you wanted to, not quite, but close. And the math becomes more complicated. So this is more the most closest to, to mm -hmm. it's called also an anthropomorphic arm. So rotation, 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 uh, two rotations, it means a two degree of freedom shoulder and elbow, then a rotation about the wrist another rotation about the wrist, another rotation about the wrist. Our wrist is a three degree of freedom system. Our elbow, one degree of freedom. Our human shoulder would be three degree of freedom. So they basically kept, they could have had another rotation about this axis to have a full human-like arm. Okay, good. Um, let me just skip that and just go to a last remark. Joint space and operational space. So we'll get more of that. But we now have basically these two spaces, and we've seen them now more profoundly. We have the space in which the robots can move, which is the joint space, either prismatic or revolute joints. And we have the end effect that is the thing which we care about. And the spaces of these two systems are interestingly different. So I'm not going to go into this too much. So the joint, well, end effect of space is usually a point in space and a set of rotations, for instance, Euler or fixed angle rotations then you just have a six vector or a quaternion, then you would need a seven vector. Um, the joint angles are just a vector of all these guys concatenated. Here's our direct kinematics equation one more time. But I wanted to actually go to something, to just the workspace. So if you look at the workspace in joint space, it's a very simple workspace for a robot. It basically means one degree of freedom is Q1, one degree of freedom is Q2, they both have a min and a max, and then you get basically a nice rectangle, or in multiple dimension, it's a hyper rectangle um, in which you live. This is cool, so this is very easy to understand. Everybody likes that. The problem is that what happens if you try to map this space, the entire joint space, into any effective space? What does it look like there? And the annoying thing is it looks like this suddenly. So, this is a two joint arm example, I believe. Um, so here is, let me to reorient. So there is, yeah, this is the first joint and then there's the second joint which moves. And this is the, the hashed space, is all the space you can reach. And this is what we got from mapping this nice 2D, 2D rectangle which we had in the previous plot to end effector space. So that looks vastly different. And there's many things which make sense. So fine. Okay. Here's my elbow. Here's my, my, my end effect. Now, 
if Mother Nature had given me a tiny little short forearm, okay, like this, I would never be able to scratch my shoulder. I can do this now. But if this thing were half as long, I could only get to my biceps. No scratching. And you see automatically so that there's workspace limitations in a system like this. So basically here it shows if this, if this degree of freedom just rotates, this is all the things where you can get to. And this is kind of the extreme posture of the first degree of freedom that rotating around this gets where you can get to. But this is then it. So you cannot get to any of these other white spaces. So you can only get anything in here and you can get in there. You can basically reason your way through how this looks like, but it's a complicated curved uh, space. And that's kind of the annoyance of life that we later on, we have to actually plan in the external world how to get from one point to the other point, making sure that it's actually realizable. And it's very easy to basically be in this X0, Y0 coordinate system and just say, oh, let's plan something from here to there. Now that's great. You can only realize in this part of your path what you want to do. The other ones are not reachable. And these are then typically called inverse kinematics errors in the entire topic of how to plan in external sp space and map it into a motion in internal space is called inverse kinematics. And that's what we're going to talk about <coughs> on Thursday. And then we're done. Yay. Questions, remarks, complaints? Good, go home fast. <laughs>